thank you. Because <laughs> I always start before we start recording that we have to start again. It's, it's too much. <laughs> um, so welcome everyone to our meeting. Is it meeting number nine, I believe? Awesome. Great. So um, <laughs> yeah. So I believe then if you've attended every meeting so far, you have gone to enough meetings to earn a credit. Um, if you've missed one, I also, I think you still have the ability to earn a credit so far. And then also you're able to make anything up with the recordings on YouTube, if that's something you want, though the deadline for registration for the credit has passed. Yeah, Riley? Um, I wasn't able to attend last week's meeting and there mm -hmm. wasn't a video up for it yet. So what's that all about? Yeah, we yeah. actually decided not to put the video up from last week, not because it's not okay, but we just had like more of an intense conversation and some private stories were shared then. Um, so we just like didn't want to put it out to YouTube because we don't feel like we feel like we just want to keep it as a safe space. So we're kind of just going to give everyone like everyone came to that one. We'll just like mark it off as like a you get that one, a nice little pass. Um, All right. So don't worry about no. it. <laughs> yep. Um, so just like a nice freebie, just because we feel like we shouldn't be posting things online if someone didn't consent to it really. And if it's like such an intense conversation that is meant for a group like this, shouldn't be posted online for everyone to see. So yeah. Um, cool. So I'm going to start the presentation. Today we're talking about lighting, uh, talking about basically the G&E group of um, film set. So let me share my screen. All right, so lighting. <laughs> uh, if you guys can hit or scan the QR code uh, for um, attendance for this meeting, um, as always. Um, but I'm very excited for this um, specific uh, meeting. It's going to be really fun, I think, and just something really informative. As we said in past meetings before, um, women are typically excluded from the more technical aspects of filmmaking, or at least we are not given the opportunities as much as men to like participate in this. So like learning about the more technical things within filmmaking, I think is really valuable. Um, and so I'm excited to share what we got. Um, but to start it off, um, I wanted to share the woman of the week. This week it's Hital Dedya, sorry, Hital Dedya. Um, uh, she's Indian cinema's first and only female gaffer, really. Um, and I think her story is pretty amazing. And I think, and we're just gonna share a couple minutes of this video to start because like she speaks it better, speaks her story better than I can, so. Can you guys, can you guys hear it? Fuck. <laughs> oh. Okay. Um, Did you hear a computer sound, Julia? Yeah. I mean, it feels great to be the only uh, female gaffer to be doing this for so many years, you know. But um, job is a job. I don't think a man or a woman will be different at it. Yeah.
Yeah, so that's it all. Um, I think she's really cool and a really interesting look at like the Bollywood side of filmmaking, um, specifically how like much more gender separated things are there. Um, and that Hollywood is not the monolith that it seems. And so like opportunities everywhere and like women are making opportunities everywhere. And this Indian gaffer, I think is someone who's like very exemplary of that. Um, yeah, so that's our woman of the week. Um, so to get into the presentation, me and Cassie are actually going to be collaborating on this a bit. So um, I'll first start talking about um, just the lighting department in general and um, what the main positions are. There are four, I think, main positions that you have to know if you want to be in the um, g &A department. The first is the gaffer, which is what Hatal was. Um, they're in charge of the electrical work on production, leading the team of technicians who install the equipment and arrange the power supply in order to create a designated lighting effect. Gaffers work closely with the director of photography to visualize in a practical way the look they are trying to convey. Um, so the gaffer is really just the head of G&E. They're the ones who plot the lighting plots and make sure that like this is where a light goes and that it eventually gets set up. Um, they work with the director of photography who usually works much closer to the camera and the, the gaffer is the one who's worked on the external side of things to make sure that the look is the correct one that the director of photography wants. Um, the key grip then um, is the head of the set operations department. They work with the director of photography to also set up the correct lighting and blocking, um, but they work, I've always seen the gaffer is the one doing the electricity and the grip is the one doing uh, the, the physical stuff that doesn't really involve um, Electricity, if, you, if Cassie, if you have a different opinion on what exactly the difference is between them, um, go ahead and like, chime in if you want. But um, the grip sometimes will um, move the camera. If like they have a big like system, they'll be the ones helping with the physical labor of stuff like that. Um, they'll be the ones like setting up C-SANS while the gaffer is the one setting up the lights, which is an important distinction sometimes. Um, so yeah, um, then there's the best boy grip and the best boy electric. Um, they're just the head assistants to either the key grip or to the gaffer. Um, they help with all the logistics sides of stuff. Um, they deal with the electric truck, rentals, manpower, and other kinds of logistics like that. Just so that when the grip and the gaffer, key grip and the gaffer want to do something, um, the best way to make sure that they can get it done in as timely possible as, um, as is possible. Um, and then the grips work underneath these three people just to help however they can, move things around, do a lot of the grunt work and the physical labor that is necessary on set. Um, g and &E groups are specifically responsible for handling, handling lighting instruments, cables, and setting up the lighting gear as instructed by the best boy or gaffer. Um, a lot, all four of these need to have a fairly uh, good understanding of electricity and how it works and the safety behind it. Um, because electricity, when used improperly on set can and will kill people if used improperly. Um, there are like discharges and uh, blowouts and things like that, which can be very dangerous in a small set and even more dangerous if you have a really big set with really, really high, um, high voltage hikes and very expensive lights. Um, so this just means like a good quality understanding of like what is safe and what is not. Um, because if they don't, someone can very easily get hurt more easily than in any other department. Um, and just to jump in on that, the like voltage and stuff of certain outlets, especially at Emerson, that's usually the best boy electric job. They are the ones that have to know the understanding of like electrics and physics and like, oh, if we have this light plugged into this circuit, we can't plug in this light to the circuit because it's going to blow fuse. That's kind of like their main thing, like when Julia said logistics, like if a, like a fuse blows, it's because usually the best boy electric wasn't aware that like those lights were being plugged into the same circuit. Yeah, no, thank you, Cassie. Um, and then just another thing about like safety for the, for the g and &E team um, is uh, just heavy lifting and stuff like that. 
because there are a lot of really like expensive and or heavy things on set that sometimes need to be moved. And so usually you need a lot of grips and sometimes there's protocol of making sure that like, unless three grips are touching an object, you can't move something or something like that just because like the safety procedures involved, like they don't want anyone actually dropping something onto someone or breaking it or something like that. Um, so yeah, just important to make sure that like, this has to be the safest department or else it endangers a ton of other people. Um, so just getting in, oh, some of the stuff didn't load. Oh no, there it is, okay. Um, so just some uh, important lingo to know um, when you're working in Genie or really on any kind of film set. Um, first is to Hollywood something. That's when something is not on a stand or is not like secured in place, but instead someone is acting as a stand themselves and just holding something up. Um, this is usually done like if you're doing guerrilla filmmaking is in like trying to go by and do something really fast. Or if you just need like for one shot, one time, you need to hold up either a flag or a stand or some kind of prop in the middle sometimes even. Um, it, it's just a fun saying to say like, oh, we're gonna Hollywood it means we're gonna not do it properly, which I think is a very hmm, interesting thing. <laughs> um, you usually want to avoid Hollywooding something. Um, so if you have a stand or a flag or, or a light or something like that, you will want to eventually um, like secure it or else again, something might fall, something might break, um, but sometimes it is necessary to get a quick shot. Um, points is when you're walking with equipment and you're telling everyone else to be aware of their surroundings. Um, if you're carrying a large load of something or if you're holding the camera even and moving through, you say points just so people understand that like what you're carrying is either valuable or somewhat dangerous and like people should avoid you when you're walking through with them. Um, just to jump in there, if it's the camera that's moving too, like the people holding the camera usually say camera moves just because the camera is like usually the most expensive piece of equipment on set. And if the camera breaks, you can't make a movie. So mm -hmm. the camera has its own little thing just to make sure everybody knows like, oh, that's the camera. Mm -hmm. For sure. And honestly, even like lenses sometimes have to be like told because lenses are so expensive. Um, so like if you're carrying something that's either expensive or dangerous or like potentially like, like other people should be aware that you are moving it, you just say points or camera moving of some kind. Um, it's, it's really, it's just all about safety. Um, Cassie, you want to take another one? Sure. So flying in is like, it just means that the necessary item or person is on its way to site or on its way to that location. So um, like on set, when you're looking for something, you'll call eyes on. So if I was looking for an extension cable, I would be like eyes on stinger and whoever has it would be like stinger flying in now. Or if like, this is like not lighting, but like if you were looking for an actor, you would be like, oh, like blank is flying in, meaning that they're on their way to set. Yeah, exactly. Um, and a lot of student films doesn't don't use these things. That's sometimes too specific. But if you're on a really big set with over a hundred people or something like that in a professional capacity, and you only have a walkie talkie, you have to like shorten stuff down and make sure that this is like clear lingo for anyone who's looking for stuff. So if you're saying like eyes on um, a person, it's gonna be really hard for you to find them without like using this kind of lingo and like understanding where they are without using this kind of lingo. So it really just helps like make the whole process more efficient um, sometimes. Um, so uh, a stinger is just an extension cable. Absolutely no one told me this when I was a freshman. And so when I was <laughs> look at a stinger, I'm like, a bee? What? <laughs> um, so it's just, it's a, it's a good little thing to understand, especially if you want to take a cinematography class or something along those lines, um, because stingers are honestly the most valuable thing, a piece of equipment you have on set, um, in my opinion, because we use so many of them so often. Um, 100%. <laughs> mm -hmm, yeah. And you'll always want, if you're doing like a tech request or something like that, or getting something from the EDC, get extra stingers. Absolutely. Because you will always need more than you will actually think you do. If you're like, oh, we have five lights. So I should only get like three stingers because I'll have the six. No, get, get as many as you can. <laughs> you'll eventually need them. Um, even if it's just to like charge your phone. I don't know. <laughs> it won't go to waste. Um, Cassie, you want to take that one? Sure. So strike and saving just refer to what you're doing with the light. So you say strike when you're turning the light on so that 
people around the light know that it's turning on and they don't get accidentally blinded. Um, you have to do this absolutely in every setting, even if you're not on set and you're just like testing out equipment. And like Emily and I were testing out a light and it was pointing at people at the ADC. So you had to yell strike so that they knew that it was turning on so that they didn't get blinded because these lights are bright. Um, and then saving is just letting people know that the light is turning off in case like they were using the light for something. It's really just about like safety and letting people like be aware of their surroundings. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, and strike is super important. I have been the victim of like staring directly at the light as it, as it turns on. It's like it hurts and it's fun. Um, especially if you're using like an HMI light, which we will get into later. Um, even though like it is just, just say strike, please, for the love of everything, just say strike. <laughs> um, you don't want to accidentally hurt someone. Um, and then finally, just crossing is just basic kind of film etiquette. It's not just for GE, &E, but it's it works for everyone. But if you cross in front of a camera, it's just polite to say I'm crossing. Um, because if a camera operator or if they're possibly like filming something, like they should be aware of it. And then if they are filming and like you accidentally cross in front of it, like it's just it's just polite. Um, but it should be avoided at all cross costs unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, just because it's you don't, like, they'll get very mad because even if they're trying to set frame or get something in focus or testing focus, they mm -hmm. will get mad if you don't let them know that you're gonna cross in front of the camera. Yeah, for sure. And sometimes it's unavoidable, like a piece of equipment has to move here because it's the only place that's clear, because usually the place in front of the camera is like clear. Um, but it is not walking space. So if you have a good reason for it, say crossing. Um, yeah. So yeah, just like some important lingo that we think like should know if you're entering into this um, stuff. Um, so this is kind of a review. We a little bit talked about this in the cinematography um, meeting, um, but it's important as a gaffer, even though you never actually touch the camera or at least you shouldn't, um, you need to understand the settings of the camera and how that affects the lighting that you eventually do um, because it, they are intrins intrinsically linked. Um, if the camera does not have the correct settings in order to like view the light that you are giving, you have to change the light. Mm -hmm. um, and if you if your light is too dim and you're, you have to change the camera settings, but if the DP has a specific look, you always have to cater to the camera's wants, um, not the other way around usually, unless you're outside and can't control the lighting. Um, so just as a review, ISO refers to how bright an image is or how at least how sensitive your camera is to the light. Um, if, it, if you have um, a really high ISO and it's a really bright place already, it will get like noisy and blurry a little bit. Um, same if it goes too dark. Um, it's just important to know like where the proper like place is. If you can see on the bottom right of this little graphic, that's what it looks like when it's a little bit noisy. Um, and from what I've heard from my professors and stuff like that is that it's almost a trademark of student films to have, um, of bad student films to have like slightly off ISO. Um, so if you want your films to look professional, like it's a really good idea to have a good understanding of what ISO like you need for your shot. And it changes sometimes with each um, different scene, but maintaining a consistent ISO within the scene is really important um, to show off at least um, that you're not a, like an amateur, or at least like a complete amateur with this filmmaking. Um, it's a good way just to show off a little bit more uh, knowledge that some student films can have. Um, and then f-stops refers to the aperture setting, lower f-stops, number means that the hole on the left, on the hole in the camera lets light in uh, wider. Whoa, wow, that wasn't a sentence. Wow. <laughs> you're doing good, Julia. Thank you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, but the aperture of the hole in the camera that lets light in, as it changes, the amount of light that it lets it into the camera changes. And so a gaffer has to understand how much light they need to create in order for the camera to properly capture that amount of light. I think that made more sense. Please tell me if it doesn't. It's still really confusing and it's honestly like something I haven't mastered either, um, but it is important to at least have a basic understanding and knowledge of this if you want to work in a more technical aspect. Um, with either the camera or with lights and sound, or not sound, with lights in general. <laughs> and once again, I'm going to just plug the 16 millimeter film production class because um, it really goes into depth in all of this and like why the f-stop matters and why ISO matters and like what effect it has because the 16 millimeter camera is completely analog. 
like digital it's just like you can like push a button and like switch the image until like you see that it looks good mm -hmm. with the camera at like the 16 millimeter camera even though you can like see the image it's not accurate to what's actually shooting because of the amount of light that's coming in so you really have to have an understanding of like the light reading and like f-stop and then iso and then the shutter speed and how that changes it we're not going to go into that because this is just like a very like basic lighting presentation because there's so much stuff that you could like go into for like two hours and then that would confuse everybody including me so we're just gonna keep it as that but we'll get into like why upsets matter in a little bit for like a lighting mm -hmm. exercise yeah yeah but i think the main point that we want to get across with this is like the light and the camera are intrinsically and in, intrinsically linked and it's important to understand both if you want to be like successful and understand and properly utilize the tools you have at your disposal um so just another camera thing that's important for um lighting people to know and um camera operators as well is the dynamic range of a camera um so the dynamic range is how much light and how much darkness the camera can capture without losing information and that's probably the simplest i can put it um if you ever taken a camera and put it outside and then seen that the sky is completely white even though you know it's blue with like these gorgeous clouds that's because the the light in the photo is outside of the settings in the dynamic range of your camera usually this is like this is um controlled by the iso and the f-stop um, but this is just the, the general term for the light capabilities of your camera. Um, so as you can see in the bottom left, like the sky is bright white in the top, in the, in the left, but then on the right side of that image, the darkness within the leaves, um, that's actually lost information. If you went back through it digitally and tried to either recreate and bring back the blue in the sky or get a little bit more light from within the leaves, you actually wouldn't be able to do it. Um, without like advanced color correction of some kind, um, just because the camera did not like intake any of that information. Actually, um, they didn't record that information because really cameras are just information, <laughs> and then transferring that into an image, um, which is a whole other kind of technical side of things, which I'd love to get into, but we do not have time. <laughs> um, because it would, as Cassie said, it would take hours. Just to refer back to. Ed stops um, for this but um, like it's just important. sorry i think we're lagging on my end um Go for it. but like the image on the far left would have an f-stop of like two because that means that the lens is really really open and it's getting too much light in which is why it's overexposed like that and then the f-stop like towards the right side would be like eight or something because it's lower and so the hole is smaller um, or it's higher, so the low, the hole is smaller, so it's less light that's getting in, which is why it's really, really dark. If that just helps anybody understand, like what f-stops do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you, Cassie. Um, and then just like a fun little fact that I think is super interesting is that we're just trying to make cameras that are basically like the same as the human eye. I mean, the main thing that is stopping us from doing that is we can't really create the sensitivity of a camera to like create the same level of dynamic range that the human eye can. Um, that's why when finding movies that look really good at nighttime um, and shot with cameras that like look really good at nighttime is really difficult because like um, the dynamic range within a camera is not like the same as our eyes. Um, so in the bottom right, you can kind of see like the pink circle or circle. God, I'm really tired guys. I'm so sorry. <laughs> the pink rectangle um, shows kind of where most cameras like have their dynamic range at. Um, if it goes any lower or higher than that, like it will lose information, but the human visual eye can like visual, God, guys, it's not a good day for me. <laughs> the human eye can um, see much further than that, which I think is really interesting. Um, and so a lot of like camera companies are just striving to recreate our eyes, which still hasn't been done. So I think it's cool. Um, okay. Another really important thing for a gaffer or anyone on the g &E team to understand is color temperature. Um, color temperature is really fun to mess around with and I think it's like one of the best parts of being a gaffer um, in general because it's like really good to have um, the talk about color temperature with your um, director of photography or cinematographer and just like hash out exactly what makes the look of the film like the look of the film. Um, color temperature does not actually like 
correlate to actual temperature. <laughs> um, it's measured in Kelvin, um, and it is more about the color spectrum of the light, obviously. Um, there are two keystone numbers that are most commonly used by filmmakers. Um, 3200 is uh, the warmer tone, and it simulates like indoor lighting. Um, so basically you would set any of your lights at this, at this color temperature. Um, and then you would also set your camera at that color temperature. And then that lighting um, would mimic basically the same as like fluorescent lights indoors or like what we normally see with our human eyes. Um, then there's 5600. Um, it's a cooler color and is used outdoors to mimic sunlight very often. Um, Again, these two numbers are the most important when you're talking about color temperature. If you remember them and set your lights to either one of them, usually it's just like it helps make your film look professional and the lighting look professional in general. Um, you can use other ones as well, but that's usually more of a creative choice, um, especially higher or lower temperatures in these, because then it gets really extreme and you can definitely tell that it's a choice. Um, so it's just important to understand and use them like sparingly if you can. Um, um. Just yep. before we move on, sorry, go for it. All good. Um, hold on. I'm gonna take my background off for a second, just so I can talk a little bit about how you get color temperature. So for, for LED lights, usually they have a setting on them where you can just manually adjust color temperature and it'll make them warmer or cooler because it's LED and it's like just pure electricity. Um, but if you're using like Fresnel lights, which we'll get into the different types of lights later, you need to use these buds. Um, these are gels and there are a range of blue to orange gels that you'll put on the lights and it like slowly brings up the color temperature. Yeah, sir. I don't think it's gonna work, but like we can try. Eh, not really, so this is like, there's like a range and it's like hard to show over like Zoom. But just like know that this is how, if you're using like, I, I always go to call them analog lights because you do have to like change it manually. But if you're using these, like that's how you would do it. So if you have a light that's like naturally at a 3200 Kelvin temperature, you have to put like blue gels on it to make it look more and more like daylight. And there's like different strengths. There's like halves and fulls, but we're not gonna get into that because that's really confusing and I don't even understand it fully. So. Yeah, there's that. Thank you, Cassie. Sorry, I had to hop out for a second. I, my computer was dying. <laughs> um, so then just continuing a little bit with color temperature. Um, again, speaking more of how like, the lights and the camera are intrinsically linked. Um, if the camera's color temperature settings and the light's color temperature are match, um, it will simulate white light and the color, the actual orange or the blue temperature, the color that you see will cancel out. Um, you can see this happening in the top right with the good place screen cap. Um, either they chose 3200 or 5600 on both the color settings and it canceled them out, causing it to look this like nice white Hollywood style flat lighting. Um, Bottom two then are examples of um, when they are used creatively. Um, on the bottom right, it's daylight lighting, so 5600, um, and the camera is now set at a warmer color temperature, causing it to have this blue tint on most of the lighting everywhere. Then this uh, photo here um, from Do the Right Thing is tungsten lighting, but then the camera is set at a daylight setting. Um, causing it to have this warm orange tone throughout this entire film. Um, so directors uh, and cinematographers and gaffers will use this like um, in a creative way for in a lot of different reasons. Um, and I just think it's cool and a creative thing to know and important to know if you want to um, do technical things in the field. Um, so continuing, speaking then of specific like equipment and things that you need to know. Um, sorry, I got distracted. Um, things you need to know um, just as a gaffer in general. There are a ton of different kinds of lights. Um, there's the tungsten light, which <laughs> as um, we just talked about with color temperature, it gives off a warm orange indoor-ish light. They're also called quartz halogen lights sometimes. Um, they get very hot, very, very, um, we'll talk a little bit more about like what you do to stay safe, but 
leather gloves are the most important thing sometimes. Um, lights can get so hot that like there can get third degree burns very easily, um, which is why you don't touch a gap or lights if you're not part of the DNA team or if you're not sure if it's like safe or not. Um, but the tungsten and then also Fresnels and HMI, HMIs, I think, well, tungsten and Fresnels for sure um, are very hot sometimes. So safety is really important. Um, so then Fresnels are like much more even lighting, allows the beam to be like uh, very from flood to spotlights. Um, so you can flood an entire room or you can like pinpoint light on something and that versatility is really helpful with the light um, for gaffers and DP. I'm just gonna jump in just cause like I got like slightly triggered. It's <laughs> Okay. For Fresnel, not Fresnel, just like for everybody that knows. Like if you do misspeak, like everybody will know like what you're talking about, like if you say it on set. But it's like a slight like pet peeve of mine. So yeah. it's it's Fresnel, the S is silent. Don't know why. Don't know who came up with it's, it. It's French. It, oh, it's French. Of course it's French. Anyways. Stupid French. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm very bad at um pronouncing things. So thank you, Cassie, for, for all good. Yeah. Um, so moving on from the whatever it's called. <laughs> um, then there's the HMI, which we talked about a little bit before. Um, but they're super bright, super, super bright. They're usually used to like simulate sunlight. Um, if you are in an indoor area and it's nighttime or something like that, but you're like, oh, it's a daytime scene and you want to show shine light through a window, HMI is your best bet. Um, they yeah, I, they're very bright, <laughs> is my, my biggest takeaway from all of this stuff. Um, commonly, we'll need a generator or some kind of external source um, in order to be used properly, um, which, again, is under the, the, the responsibility of the genie team um, because they are so high power and so like bright that they need all that extra power. And if you hook them up into a house or into something in normal power grid, it will either not work or backfire horribly. So I wouldn't recommend doing <laughs> that. HMI is also a two person light. And I believe it's the only light at Emerson that you have to get a certification for because it is so big and so expensive. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to throw that out there. Like Emerson does have one. I think only the BFA program has access mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. And they're very expensive. So please, if you're ever using an HMI on set, make sure that one of the people working it is certified and just like both people are like being paying attention because it's heavy and it's big and it's scary yeah. and my least favorite light personally, but. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> then there's fluorescent lights, which we've all seen because they're everywhere at Emerson in like every hallway. <laughs> um, but um, they're more compact and usually cooler um, operation than any of these other lights uh, besides LEDs. Um, so they're a lot easier to handle and a lot more versatile. Um, they are um, tubes instead of the normal, like just the more compact, either squares or circles, um, but they come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. They are really popular in music videos as um, just general lighting sources. Um, and I like them, but not as much as I like LEDs. I am a huge LED fan. I think they're by far better than anything besides maybe the HMI at lighting, um, because the HMI is so specific to like really, really, really bright lights. But the LED battery charged if you need it to be. Um, and what I think is really cool is that they have recently um, come up with LEDs that are remotely controlled. So once you set them up, you can change the color temperature, change any kind of temperature, um, simulate gels, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and are just, I think, better and easier to handle, especially at the level that we are right now as student filmmakers, because you can do a lot more, more with, I think, three LED lights than three any other kind. Um, but I am a little bit biased. Yeah, go Cassie. I, um, I, I agree that LEDs are the most convenient light, but they aren't as strong as the Fresnel lights. So in here we have like a three-point Ari kit. Um, the Arias are probably best, in my opinion, for indoor lighting. They're a pain in the ass to set up. You have to worry about heat and gels and all that stuff. But they do look better on camera than LEDs. But LEDs are, like, the most convenient. So I get where Julia's coming from, but I just wanted to throw that out there. I disagree that they look better, but we don't have time. So I'm going to <laughs> We'll fight about this after. We'll fight. We will. It'll be fine. <laughs> um, so then continuing on with more equipment that's really important for a gaffer or for a director of photography, both. Um, 
just are the flags. Um, they're basically just big boards of cloth that you can place in front of lighting sources in order to shape the light. Um, so when placed strategically around a source, a flag can remove light or change the light's behavior, and they can shape how the light reflects and block specific areas of light on a screen. Um, Cassie, you've got an example of one, right? I don't have flags because I didn't have access to them for the EDC, but I have a whole bunch of gels, which I wanted uh, to show. Nice. Do you happy. want to talk about that? Um, we can, we'll talk about gels in a second. You can finish up the flags, but. Okay, sounds good. Um, flags are the most are the most common thing to be Hollywooded, if you remember the um, term, where it's like, we'll just have a grip holding up a flag and making sure that the light is shaped properly. Um, they're really fun to use and fun to like mess around with, um, and it really changes the behavior of the light in a way that can be really cinematic if you use them properly. Um, Cassie, you want to go ahead and talk about gels? Yes. So these are gels. These, okay, so these are also gels. So these are the only gels that the EDC has. They're to mimic color temperature. And then they have like diffusion gels too, but it, 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 if you want to do fun lighting, which is my personal favorite, as you can see, like, I don't know what kind of lights those are that they're putting gels on that way. Usually you clip them to the barn doors and make the uh, super gels with these these are clothes pins on set they're going to be called c47s don't be confused i was very confused first time because nobody decided to tell me that but c47s you put these to the barn doors of the lights and it changes the color obviously I, the, 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 there's no way for me to show you online but it's really, really fun if you're doing like a party scene or like an experimental film and you want to light like half of somebody's face red or all of them red to show like anger or whatever it's it's fantastic. I got these for like fifteen dollars on Amazon. Highly recommend. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there anything technical that I have to say about gels? Hold on. No, I no. think they're pretty um, pretty well. Like it's they're just really fun and they're the most I'd say like the most like obviously creative part of uh, the G eating team. Um, and they're really fun to play with and mess around with. I put gels on top of lights in my dorm. I don't recommend it, <laughs> but it is a fun way of changing up the lights for sure. Um, One thing I will say with gels is, especially if you're using, actually it, LEDs, it's not as um, like imperative because the LEDs don't get hot, but if you're using Fresnels or like tungsten lights or something that's gonna get hot, it, the reason I say barn doors is because if you put the gel directly onto the light, it's going to melt like this. And that is just not fun for anyone. Mm -hmm. um and the edc will charge you for them and the edc gels are very expensive like these were cheap on amazon because they're not like the best like quality but they work um but do not ever put gels or diffusion or anything directly against the light like that goes to the flags too because the flags you can burn holes through them and then that's also money that you have to pay to the edc so um just always make sure that there's a distance between the hot lights that you're working with and whatever you're holding up in front of them. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Cassie, for adding that. Um, so I'm just going over just the tools of the trade, things that you should at least think of getting if you want to be on the GE team or if you want to begin learning how to be on the G team, GE team. Um, a set of leather gloves is really important. Um, utility gloves of some kind uh, help again if you want to hold the lights that are usually very hot. Um, it's just a safety thing. And sometimes um, if you don't have gloves, you won't be allowed to pick up certain things and it just, it's safety. Um, a multi-tool is really helpful. It's just got, it's what its name is. It helps with a lot of things. It's a tool for many things. Um, and you never know what you need um, set sometimes. So a multi-tool is just a good way to stay prepared. Um, flashlights, if it gets dark and you want to see into a place that's dark, usually this is for indoors or night shoots more than anything. Or if you want to like point across a set without like going there yourself, it's just sometimes helpful. Um, a roll of black gaffer tape. Um, this is just, it's always helpful. Someone will always need it. So it's always just good to have some. It is slightly expensive, very expensive, but like it will be used and will be necessary at some point in time. So I, I, it's a good investment to make. Um, also, wait, one thing about gaffer or mm -hmm. gaffer tape, like 
be careful because it's very strong. Um, if you put it on walls, it'll rip off tape or paint. So like, you know, just be cautious about where you're using it and use it for the right purposes. Like, you know, taping down stingers or taping um, gels onto the lights, you know, but be cautious because it is pretty, it's like duct tape, but like the better duct tape, I don't know. It's just like way more strong. So be cautious on where you put it. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Um, and then just two more things. Cassie already talked about clothespins and clamps, just things that help um, secure either gels or more bulky things in place. Um, it's just good to invest in those. And then cube taps um, sometimes help if you have like a smaller um, like need for a voltage thing or whatever. Um, if you need to split that up, then sometimes it's helpful to have like a mini eccentric core basis or a mini um, power strip almost on you. Um, just because it helps. Um, so that's what I have for that. Um, Cassie, do you want to start talking about in-person lighting? Yes. Okay. So this is more for the in-person meeting because they'll get to like do this, like um, obviously like they'll get to play with the kit. I'm just gonna take this off. Okay. Um, so the kit that we're gonna show you because it's the one that I had access to through my class is the RE three point kit. These are finale lights, so they're the type that get really, really hot. Um, so this is, in my opinion, the most useful kit at Emerson. Um, if you're doing like a shoot where you need like really strong lights inside, um, we're not gonna plug them in because uh, getting up is a lot of work, but they come, This the image isn't like as accurate, um, but they come with two 650 watt, um, Watts? Yeah. yeah. Watts, lights, and then one 750. The 750, and we'll get into like the different types of lighting, but the 750 is your key light because it's the strongest, and we'll get into that later. You don't have to understand what I mean right now. Um, so they come with three lights, and then light stands for each of the lights. Um, these you can also put on C stands if you wanted to, but I, I don't know. I don't like the light stands that the Emerson kits come up because they're old kits. So this everything kind of a little banky, but um, they also come with, oh, somebody didn't listen. Okay, so this is what I'm talking about. Don't put anything on the lights because they will burn. This is a softbox diffusion. It's not on that, but it's just another thing like a flag or an umbrella or whatever that changes like the intensity of the lighting. Um, scrims are essentially like, flags that you put directly into the light. They are metal and the red ones are single and the green ones are double. That's always like a rule for any like type of color on set. Like even with the flags, the one with the red rim is a single. So it'll diffuse it like halfway. And then the double will diffuse it as if you had two singles, obviously math. Um, they, yeah, they're directly in front of the light. Um, barn doors you put on the lights. These are the worst things in the world, but you have to use them. Um, they go on the lights so that you can put a gel on if you need to, or if you just need to shape the light in a way where you have it like pointing as a spotlight on somebody, like that's what you use the barn doors for. Um, nobody likes barn doors. You can ask anybody that's done lighting at Emerson ever. They hate barn doors because like I said, these are really old kits and the barn doors are really like hard to work with, but say la vie. Um, yeah, so just like, I don't know. I, this is like, we could do a whole nother meeting on like how to check stuff out of the EDC. But as you can see, there's a lot of like little parts to this kit. And this is just one of their most basic kits. So when you're checking stuff out of the ABC, you have to make sure that every single thing is in this kit. Otherwise you will get fined for it. Um, yeah, and then that's all that I wanted to say about the kit. It, there's not much we can do with it because you guys are like over Zoom, but yeah, yeah. it's hard to work with, but it gets good results. Yeah. Thank you, Cassie. Um, and yeah, so like she said, it's just a basic kit and something that you should like this is a good like beginning step into understanding what GE does. Um, so yeah, thank you, Cassie, for sharing. Um, 
So then just another kind of basic stuff to get into GNE e um, is three and three point lighting. We've talked about this, I think, again, at the cinematography um, meeting, but just as a recap, the key light is the main source of light, cast the hardest shadows and also the strongest light. It has to be, in order to be like truly effective, um, or at least in the basic sense of it, about 45 degrees away from the camera. Um, if the actor was in the center of a circle 45 degrees away. Um, and you put the key light at 100%, then you put the fill light at 50%. And it's usually um, the main function is to lessen and eliminate the shadow that's cast by the key. Um, I mean, a good example right now is like the zoom, like my face right now, I have one key light, which is the window right next to me. And there is absolutely no fill light on this side. So there's pretty hard shadows on my face. Um, so with a fill light, it would then like have a more even look. And then a backlight um, is not necessary, but it helps like make the person pop from the background, um, which sometimes is necessary for a shot if they like have the same color clothes as the background of some kind. Um, this is really helpful for documentary films. Um, this is almost always a setup for an interview. Um, and so like, and then almost every other kind of variation of lighting setup is at least some variation or some adaptation of this kind of lighting. So understanding this as a basic level is really important then to move it up to higher level stuff. Um, so then virtual stuff, just for the virtual meeting, um, interesting things that we can look at. Um, Emily H found this really cool three-point lighting simulator if you wanted to go more in depth on um, like what exactly, how you change up stuff in, um, when you're setting up three-point lighting. Um, and then something that I used actually when my directing course went virtual last March um, is a thing called Frameforge. Um, it's expensive, but sometimes Emerson might pay for it if you ask them nicely. <laughs> um, and it's a computer aided film set simulator. I see it as a mix between like The Sims and like a film set simulator. Like it's very, it's not a game, but it's a very useful tool um, where you can legitimately like build up sets and then create lights um, and like set them up so you can see how your film set would look. Um, the thing on the right is actually a thing I did um, as a recreation of a scene. Um, and everything you see there, I like at least created in some way or used uh, from um, their storage of like a mass amount of like a mass amount of props and sets and models and stuff like that. Um, so it's a really great tool just to kind of like pre-visualize your film and also just set up your lighting um, design beforehand, um, if that's something you're interested in. Um, but I think I, right now, I would highly recommend checking out the three-point lighting simulator, um, just because it's a great way of, like, getting those basics in. Wow, we have, like, seven minutes. That went by fast and slow at the same time. Um, but I kind of want to open up this up to the group now for the last little bit of, like, interactivity that we can have. Um, just starting out, like, how would you guys recreate either one, two, or three of these images? Kind of a gimme question, but. I can't see if anyone's raising their hand either, so just shout it out. So when looking at lighting, it's important to find like where the source is or imagine where the source is. Um, three is very similar to what I was talking about before with very harsh shadows on one side of the face and then a key light on the other. Um, so with number three, I would imagine that there's likely only one light or at least only one light that is on and it's hitting his side of his face and then there is no fill light and there is no backlight. So then extrapolating from that, how would you then go to two and to one? Um, I would say that it's like um, lights are at the same intensity of like at all places. So it's hitting all sides equally. Wait, sorry. So you think the, the light intensity changes? For number one. No, I'm saying like it's it's the intensity is the same for all the lights uh, and they're yes. all like at the same at like different points so that it's hitting all sides equally. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say that's exactly it. Um, good job. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't understand the first time. Um, but yeah, no, with this, it's likely that like, the key light, the fill light, and the backlight are all probably at the same power. Um, and then two would be when three-point lighting is like 
followed to the letter where the key light is 100 percent the fill light is at 50 and then backlight is just mildly there just to pop, make him pop a little bit more um then just more things you guys can shout it out this one's just anything you notice about the specific lighting and specific techniques they might have used things they could have used um what about the first one the bottom left um would you say that this is similar to the one before? Would you say it's different? How so? I think it's pretty similar, but it seems like the light is coming more from above as opposed to, to the side or directly in front. No, exactly. That's very good instincts. Um, she's actually not using three-point lighting in the same way that we were talking about before. In this way, it's actually Hollywood lighting where the light is 45 over and then like up way higher and facing down and hitting her forehead and cheekbones a lot. Um, Hollywood lighting was used historically. Um, it's used in like a lot of like comedies and a lot of different like more romantic kind of movies. It's made to, its purpose is to make their, the person in the camera look the best they can. Um, and so like a flatter face with not a lot of shadows usually um, is the way that Hollywood likes to do it. What about the next one? The more colorful of ones. <laughs> what do you think they were using there to make that look like that? Okay. <laughs> um, likely still a three-point lighting system. The pink is very obviously a little bit more of a key light because it takes up more of her face, um, but the people here use gels. Um, this is what gels look, you look like. They probably put a pink or a purple layered on top of a light on one side and then blue on the other to create contrast. Um, very interesting. Um, and gels are just a fun way of like making someone pop in this way. Um, for the other two, I'm going to leave it open-ended. I want you guys to think about it um, in general and just like uh, kind of create your own lighting setups if you can. Think about what you would do to recreate this. Um, looking at films and then just thinking of like how could they, how did they do it? How do they recreate it? It's a great way to like brainstorm and start thinking about your own ways of like being in the GME team. Um, um, so I believe that is the end of our presentation. Um, probably right on time, hopefully, as well. <laughs> um, just one last announcement then before we let you all go. Um, we have the Christine Vach Cassie, how do you say it? The Sean. The Sean. The Sean? Okay. <laughs> um, the producer, Woman of the Week from our producing meeting a long time ago. She is going to be meeting with us virtually for a Q&A session on November 9th. Um, we've posted about our social media. I highly recommend you guys, if you are interested in anything in Hollywood, in the film industry, in the independent film industry, in queer cinema, she is the person who is the most like knowledgeable and has a ton of experience on it. We're really excited to have her and like talk with her about it. Um, and we really want you guys to come come see it, see her with us, and um, ask her the questions you have as well. Um, so please check that out um, sometime soon, um, and we hope to see you there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, with one minute left, <laughs> I'm going to let you all go. Thank you so much for coming. Um, appreciate you guys joining, and hopefully see you guys next week for our editing meeting. Mm -hmm. yeah.